Welcome to Hanover Sparks 2020 Annual Meeting. Thank you for joining us today in this virtual format. While this is a departure from where we plan to be in April, we are pleased that we can continue to connect with you, share, and celebrate our 2019 successes, and provide an update on Ann Arbor Sparks' response to the COVID-19 global pandemic, and maybe share a Zingerman sandwich with you now or soon. It is our hope, and one that we know you share, that we will be able to be with you in person for our 2021 annual meeting at Eastern Michigan University. I'm also pleased that we will be joined by John Roberts as this year's keynoter. John is a principal and managing director of TIP Strategies. I've had the pleasure of working with John over the years, most recently through my role as past board chair and fellow member of the International Economic Development Council. John has been leading that organization's strategic planning process and his insight in advancing IDC's mission. I'm sure you will find his remarks as our keynote speaker timely and inspiring. But first, I'd like to recognize the generous sponsors of today's meeting, Premier Level Sponsors DTE Energy Foundation and Comcast Business, and our Partner Level Sponsor, First Martin. In addition to the support of these sponsors, we are fortunate to work with many valued partners to the private, public, and academic sectors. I'd like to acknowledge many of our key partners who make our work possible here in Washtenaw and Livingston County. That includes MEDC, the Ann Arbor Ypsilanti LDFA, the Livingston Economic Development Council, Washtenaw County, cities and townships in both counties. One of the unique parts of our partnership is that we have much private sector support. There are over 80 companies that are financial partners with Spark. And we couldn't get our work done without the, the committed and strong work of our elected officials, many of whom are on this virtual call, uh, virtual presentation today. As the third leg of that partnership, our partners at the University of Michigan, Eastern Michigan University, and WCC have really been stalwart in their work and support for our efforts. We've got a dedicated board of directors, an executive committee, and many, many private, public, and academic uh, partners who are participants in our operating committees. And as I do every year, I really want to acknowledge our staff. Uh, who I do sincerely believe is one of the finest in the nation in delivering economic development programming to their community. Now, it is my pleasure to invite David Parsegan, Chair of the Spark Board of Directors, to review for you our 2019 results. Thank you, Paul. 2019 was a strong economic year for the Ann Arbor region. While 2020 has presented unprecedented new challenges, Spark's performance in 2019 put us in a better position to deal with the disruption caused by the pandemic and the recovery from that disruption that we all look forward to. From the first, Ann Arbor Spark's mission has been to foster economic growth across our region, building its success on private, public, and academic partnerships with not just the city of Ann Arbor and its institutions, but also with the cities, townships, and communities that contribute to making this a great region. But the competition we faced in 2019 for economic development opportunities remained fierce. The role of Ann Arbor Spark is to amplify the significant benefits of this region to businesses looking for new places to move and grow and to attract the human talent to established and early stage businesses critical to that growth. When we are successful in doing so, there's a positive ripple effect that benefits both businesses and residential areas throughout the region. I am very pleased to report that through the strong support of all of our partners and the tireless and focused efforts of our staff, 2019 was yet again a year of significant progress, continuing to build on the now 15 years of sustained effort to increase the profile of and grow the Ann Arbor region. While that progress is detailed within Spark's 2019 annual report, allow me to highlight just a few of our successes and the broader impact of each of them. Spark's operational efforts are directed towards two primary areas, business development and support of the entrepreneurial ecosystem that has become so vital to this region. In doing so, we continued in 2019 to concentrate 
on the six areas identified in our strategic plan. Acceleration, talent, growth, communications and engagement, planning, and leadership. Let me start with business development. In 2019, Spark's business development team worked on 31 projects in every city, town, and non-rural township served by Ann Arbor Spark. These efforts resulted in 1,726 new and retained jobs and $132 million in private sector investment. In 2019, Spark also focused on leveraging the tax advantages afforded to developers within the region's opportunity zones in Chelsea, Fowlerville, Ypsilanti, and Ann Arbor. For example, Ann Arbor's Opportunity Zone is along the State Street Corridor, which was very active in 2019. Of course, the best way to illustrate for you the scope of Spark's business development impact is not to tell you, but to show you. This slide illustrates the number of Spark projects located throughout Washtenaw County from 2011 to 2018. And here is what we added in 2019. And then past projects in Livingston County. And again, those added in 2019. We are often asked whether these projects actually create the jobs they promise. The answer is yes, and then some. In fact, the companies served by Spark are producing about 10% more jobs than originally promised. Even during these challenging times, and perhaps especially so, our business development team continues to keep in contact with our existing clients and explore opportunities to attract new businesses to ensure that the momentum built in 2019 continues. Similarly, the Spark Entrepreneurial Services team built on a track record of success in supporting early stage companies in 2019 with services and capital. Last year, Spark provided consulting support and other services to more than 260 startups that employed 791 people, 86 of which Spark housed in our accelerators in downtown Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. And last year, the Spark Entrepreneurial Services team helped create 15 new technology startups. It's that work with nascent companies that yields results over time. The 716 early stage companies that Spark has assisted in the five years ending in 2019 now employ more than 2,400 people. Spark could not have delivered these services to entrepreneurs without the significant support of state investment provided by the Ann Arbor Ypsilanti Local Development Finance Authority, a program that delivers significant return on the city's investment. You won't be surprised to learn that the Ann Arbor Smart Zone produces as many startups as the rest of the smart zones in Michigan combined. Of course, no company can survive without capital. And Spark continued in 2019 to provide startups with funding in a variety of ways. As of 2019, Spark's $27 million startup capital program had attracted $765 million in matching investments for 164 companies. That's a leverage ratio in excess of 28 to 1. And those companies contribute to our region's economy in a meaningful way. In 2019 alone, they generated $101 million in annual revenue. Spark has also provided direct funding to early stage companies through the now four Spark-sponsored angel funds. Those funds have invested a total of $13 million and attracted for their portfolio companies more than 11 times that amount in matching investment. But our business development efforts and support of entrepreneurs would not be effective without the work of Spark's communications and marketing staff, who raise awareness of what we are doing and provide opportunities for all we seek to serve to engage with Spark. Perhaps the best example of this is the success and growth of A2 Tech 360. 2019 was just the second year for this event, but it represented a significant expansion over the 2018 inaugural year in order to provide more opportunities for participants to learn and connect with their peers. 
we increased the number of events by 50% and the number of participating companies by 35%. The result was over 6,000 registered attendees. Although current events forced us this year into a virtual A2 Tech 360 that is going on this week, it remains robust. This annual meeting is just one of 16 events happening this week. We're especially thankful to have so many partners join us in supporting those events, including the University of Michigan Office of Technology Transfer, Eastern Michigan University's Digital Engagement Clinic, MIHQ, and the Ann Arbor Entrepreneurs Fund, just to name a few. Of course, A2 Tech 360 isn't the only initiative that advances our strategic plans, communications, and engagement goals. In 2019, we published over 1,400 social media posts, roughly five per day, that were seen more than 4.2 million times and resulted in over 225,000 interactions. Spark delivered hundreds of thousands of individual emails, spread over 142 campaigns. The impact of those communications is clearly evident when tied to events. For example, 82% of survey respondents indicated email was how they heard about A2 Tech 360. We published multiple videos to YouTube and used our Google Grant dollars to extend their reach. Our original viewer goal was 150,000, three times the goal set for 2018 and five times the goal for 2017. By just June of 2019, Spark's marketing team had already met that goal. They doubled it by October and ended the year with nearly 350,000 views. In sum, the work of Ann Arbor Spark in 2019 was more than a success and made a positive, lasting impact on our region. We believe that the strength of our 2019 performance and our role in aggressively combating the negative effects of the pandemic that Paul will tell you about shortly will allow us to continue to grow our region once COVID-19 is behind us. Earlier, I mentioned the importance of Spark's collaboration with private, public, and academic partners. It is with great pleasure that we recognize three of those partnerships with May Mobility, MIHQ, and Ted Daco. These videos tell the story of their contributions to innovation and economic development in the greater Ann Arbor region. The former mayor of Bogota, Colombia said that a city is successful not when the poor drive to work, but when the rich take public transit. And so what we believe is that May Mobility can be part of that kind of solution, providing a transportation service that's so good that people who can afford not to use it will use it anyway. May Mobility is an Ann Arbor startup that's building autonomous electric shuttles to transform cities. We really target first and last mile types of routes because those are where you have some of the greatest inequities in transportation and some of the greatest needs. Imagine a, a downtown environment where you've got restaurants and hotels and housing all mixed together, but spread out and, and diluted by parking. And so what we wanna do is to be able to get people between those exciting places that where they wanna go, but be able to get there safely, easily, and have some fun in the process. So we come from a technical background. A lot of the company is technical in nature, but we got really motivated by how is autonomous technology going to have a real world impact? We just recently passed 250,000 revenue generating rides. And that's actually more than Waymo and Aptiv, two of the very large AV companies in the space have delivered put together. May Mobility has launched in four different cities in the United States. Detroit, Michigan, Columbus, Ohio, where we operated for a year, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Providence, Rhode Island as well. It really comes down to impact for our entire team. And so we're looking for places where there's the greatest need for new kinds of transportation, where people are underserved, when there's inequity or poor access to transportation, because those are the places that we can have the greatest positive impact. But when we thought about what we were building and where we can get the best talent in the world, it's Southeast Michigan. We have access to the smartest people coming out of the universities and people who have been working in auto for their entire lives. And we have also the great culture, the can-do attitude, 
the humble, careful approach to engineering that really is necessary to build a safe product. Creating a startup is a hard thing to do, and Spark has always been really helpful to us in terms of navigating the local ecosystem, plugging us into communities that we weren't plugged into before, even helping in business development opportunities. So they've always been there for us to help, help us grow. This is a company of true believers. Everyone here is really aligned around the mission and vision of the company. People who are passionate about having a real impact. And that's, that's a great thing for us. We feed and grow on that together. If you told me five years ago I would still be this deep in, in construction, which is almost constant, um, I would say, you know, it's everything that you can imagine. MIHQ stands for Michigan Innovation Headquarters. As people refer to the site, they can call it MyHQ. This is our expansion to sort of accommodate internal growth as well as additional companies that have expressed interest in coming to MyHQ. Our mission is to grow companies. We want to put the right infrastructure in place, create the right culture, draw in new business, and have it sort of take root and grow organically. So it was kind of born out of necessity. I had been involved with a, a company that was local here, and I acquired a building, and we fit that building up with specialized space, wet labs, clean rooms. Unfortunately, the company didn't make it. I was left with a building that had recently been renovated. About the same time, I got involved in a company from Stanford University. That company literally took you know, two offices and a lab bench. So that left the balance of the building unused. And so we just simply started to invite other early stage companies to join us. What was interesting was when one company came, typically one or two more would follow them. So we were able to fill that building very quickly. But the interaction was fascinating in that you had people from a lot of different backgrounds that could come together and help solve problems. So what we've tried to create is every opportunity for natural collision to happen, whether it's over coffee or you're here on Thursday mornings where we have bagels. Those are the times the conversations happen and people start to think about what's possible or cross-pollinate. Mark's vision of that community feel definitely happens. We actually worked with a company here who had some equipment that could scale up some reactions for us. People were looking for some products. We actually put them in contact with our colleagues and Adrian, and then they can get samples and basically we can help them. The ecosystem has been really great for us. You know, there are obviously synergies just with things like sharing equipment, for example, like on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of our employees have come out of this ecosystem, so that's been another benefit to being here. And then, you know, we, we get a lot of ideas too for new product concepts and applications from the diverse community here that we might not have come up with on our own. I mean, for a small company to find partners, that's, that's an ideal situation. And when you're in a co-working space like this, I mean, you go to Bagel Thursdays, you go to the other events they have, just in, in walking around, people in the parking lot, you find people to collaborate with. Ann Arbor is ripe with talent. We're producing new talent every day with the University of Michigan and the school systems. It seems to be the right recipe um, to continue to grow, especially high-tech companies. Spark's been a great collaborative partner, working with us helping the tenants that we have, identifying prospective tenants. We continue to work with Spark now. We're doing more together on the A2 Tech 360 to try to expand that to really shine a light on R&D and IT and mobility sectors that are growing here in the area. We are hopeful to continue to grow with new bricks and mortar to accommodate internal growth. So we do plan to, to build at least one, probably two new buildings, expand the community center with a collaborative effort with 242, and then work on a parks and trails plan that would make a nice walkable community. I think success is different for all of us. For me, the success is when I see people collaborating and, and able to get beyond you know, their own personal uh, focus to do something greater with, uh, with all the people involved. Well, Health Media was an interesting story. It was founded by Dr. Vic Strecker, and um, it was founded at a very, very, what seemed to be a pretty good time in the dot-com era, but immediately fell into the standard trap of all dot-com companies, went through a lot of money. 
When I took over, we had 85 people, and I had to dramatically take it down to 18, so it was a very emotional time. But I was blessed with 18 people who refused to let the company die. The marketplace took off, and my board never let me think about the exit. The board said, the exit will chase you, you don't chase the exit. And sure enough, in December of 2007, my phone started ringing off the hook with companies wanting to buy us or invest in us. And so we had a $200 million exit on an $18 million company. So somebody may have to check that, but that's what I was told anyway. When I left Health Media, which we sold to Johnson & Johnson, I thought it would be interesting for me to try to help others. First of all, Rick Snyder was my board member, one of my board members at Health Media, and he, he always said to me, when you sell the company, Ted, it is time to give back. So to a large degree, my mentorship comes from the advice that I got from the former governor about giving back to the community. I got involved through Spark through uh, an introduction to Bill Mayer, and Bill was kind enough to bring me into the fold and allow me to work with some organizations here. Success for me is, is success for them. So if they build a company and uh, it becomes successful, it's a high growth company, or they sell it, or they get the major funding that they want, that's how I measure success. I thought it would be nice to be a mentor where you don't have the pressure and the stress of the company. Boy, how wrong I was, because rather than worrying about one company, I'm now worrying about eight, and I feel the same allegiance to somebody else's company as I did to mine. I do three things in my life right now. I am my mentor for companies both inside and outside of Ann Arbor. I teach two entrepreneurial courses in the Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Michigan. And I'm connected to the authors of the Blue Ocean Strategy and Blue Ocean Shift books, and I run their high school global pitch competition. So I've gone from helping entrepreneurs to working with college students. I'm now dealing with high school students. By Christmas, I will be helping grade school students open lemonade stands. I think I would like to be remembered as someone who tried very hard, very, very hard to help the entrepreneurial community in Ann Arbor. I would like people to say, he never told me what I wanted to hear. He told me what he thought. And um, the second thought is, after I've passed, at least I'll say, he's not a jerk anymore. Thank you, David, and congratulations again to this year's annual meeting award recipients, May Mobility, MIHQ, and Ted Dacko. We know that each of you will continue to do great work in our community, and we value your partnerships with Ann Arbor Spark. 2019 was a very successful year, and it's important that we continue to celebrate these wins, even more so in the light of the pandemic and its impact on our community. We all, each in our own way, in the private, public, foundation, and university sectors, have been working hard to respond positively to the pandemic and the economic crisis it has spawned. I want to share with you how Spark, with many partners, have pulled together to support each other and those in need in our community. In less than two weeks after the initial stay-at-home order in mid-March, Ann Arbor Spark was standing up the Washtenaw Small Business Resiliency Fund at the request of Washtenaw County which contributed initial funding. It was quickly backed by a $1 million donation from the Song Foundation. And we want to give a special thank you to Doug and Lynn Song on behalf of the entire community. And additional funds from the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation, Bank of Ann Arbor, the New Economy Initiative, the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation, Chemical Bank, Pittsfield Charter Township, and others. We were able to award $1.38 million in grants to 529 companies. Almost simultaneously, the state launched the Michigan Small Business Relief Program and asked the 15 regional private-public partnerships, including Ann Arbor Spark, to serve as the delivery vehicle of those funds to businesses who needed it most. 
As we were already doing this at the county level, we were able to quickly scale our efforts to a more regional one. We were asked to spearhead efforts for the six county greater Ann Arbor region, including Hillsdale, Jackson, Lenaway, Monroe, Livingston, and Washtenaw counties. The state provided funding was allocated based on population to each individual county, with SPARC administering the process for Washtenaw and Livingston counties. SPARC also managed the distribution of funds for all six counties. SPARC distributed $2.35 million to 748 businesses across the greater Ann Arbor region. Specifically, $1.95 million went to 648 businesses in Washtenaw and Livingston counties in particular. In addition, we assisted with state loan funds totaling $900,000 and a local initiative, A2 Helps, which awarded over $196,000 and A2 Neighbors, which awarded $23,000. In July, the Michigan legislature allocated $100 million from the Federal CARES Act for Michigan Small Business Restart Grants. Once again, the state turned to those 15 regional public-private partnerships as the administration and distribution vehicle for the program, and SPARC resumed its role, working with the counties in the greater Ann Arbor region, as well as leading the process for Livingston and Washtenaw counties. A key component to the Restart program was its focus on businesses owned by a woman, a person of color, or a veteran. The legislature set a combined aggregate goal of 30% for these three categories. Our team aggressively marketed to these communities, and our efforts are reflected in the results. For Washtenaw County, 53% of our awardees were minority-owned businesses, 64% were women-owned businesses, and 6.7% were veteran-owned and 22% of the awardees were businesses owned by minority women. I want to give a special thank you to those community members who served on the review panels, sorting through all the applications for the assistance we received and then distributed to our communities. For the Washtenaw County Committee, Rich Tang from New Foundry, Kristen Gepsky of the Washtenaw Community College Entrepreneurship Center, Teresa Gelati from the Washtenaw County's Office of Community and Economic Development, Alyssa Asbury Payne from Washtenaw County's Racial Equity Office, and Charlie Penner from the Michigan Small Business Development Center. In Livingston County, that committee was made up of Mike Ekenall, Economic Development Council of Livingston County, Deandra Lipscomb, Lake Trust Credit Union, Sean Pressel, Michigan Small Business Development Center, Mary Robinson, Livingston County Convention and Visitors Bureau. This action to deploy capital to affected businesses vividly illustrates why our work is so critical. In all of these instances, our partners wanted to get money to businesses in need, but didn't have the capability to do so. They turned to us and our talented and capable staff was able to pivot to this work efficiently and effectively, primarily through working at home. I'm proud of our team and our work. I believe that no other entity in our region could mobilize as quickly and credibly as Ann Arbor Spark in getting money to businesses in the way we did and continue to do. For each of these programs to date, demand has far exceeded the available funds by a seven to one ratio. We know that small businesses are still at risk and are working creatively to keep their doors open and staff on payroll. We remain committed as a resource and will continue to say yes when asked to serve. We've included a deeper summary of these three programs, along with more examples of Annabur Spark's COVID-19 response with the annual report you recently received. We've been responsive to business needs and proactive in creating programs, building resource hubs, and more to aid the region's recovery. I also want to extend a special thank you to Annabur Spark's bank and credit union partners on behalf of our community. Who, these institutions made, collectively made millions of PPP loans to hundreds of companies in our region. I also want to share with you some non-COVID related efforts and accomplishments for the region so far this year. First, three high-tech companies are expanding in the area, R2 Space, Human Element, and May Mobility. R2 Space received a Defense Innovation Award, was able to add 20 people to their team, and will attract more government awards and further growth for the company. Human Element plans on adding 26 people to their ranks, growing Ann Arbor's technology footprint. Additionally, the Fast Track Awards kicked off A2 Tech 360 last Friday, during which we presented Human Element with its seven straight award. Finally, May Mobility announced its plans to invest $11.8 million 
and add 100 high-wage engineering and tech jobs at its headquarters in Pittsfield Township. Part of Spark's ethos, both in the collective efforts of our board and staff, is optimism about the economic future of our region. While we are experiencing unprecedented challenges, the assets of our region have not changed, and our unique regional collaboration positions us for a brighter future. Now, I'm thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker, John Roberts, Principal and Managing Director of TIP Strategies. For years, John has provided strategic leadership by identifying how macro issues impact local communities, such as climate change, equity, and the economic impact of the COVID-19 crisis. While John initially agreed to join us for our originally scheduled date in April, we believe his perspective is even more important for us to hear today. In John's role at TIP Strategies, he's helped transition the company from its Texas-based site selection practice to an economic strategy firm with major national recognition. His portfolio includes planning work from New York to California, with significant regional projects in the Mississippi Delta, Seattle's Puget Sound, and in the Great Lakes area. Prior to joining TIP, John was the Director of Business Development first for the state of Washington and then the state of Texas where he co-authored the state's new strategic plan. His previous experience also includes serving as vice president of the Oregon Technology Fund and lead investor for the Hood River Brewing Company, you may know the beer Full Sail, which continues to hold a prominent place in the craft brewing industry. He also managed two startup technology companies, Fiberlight Composites and LifePort, Inc. LifePort was subsequently acquired by Sigorsky. John has served on the boards of several startup technology companies and on state task forces and gubernatorial committees. He's lectured in business at the University of Washington, the University of Texas, and was on the faculty in Mary Hurst College in Portland, Oregon. John was also the founder of a mountain bike company in Portland, the Fat Tire Farm, which now operates multiple retail outlets. John, welcome, and the virtual stage is yours. I'd like to begin by thanking Paul Krutko for the invitation to do this keynote. It's a real honor to have been selected by him because, as you know, he is one of the foremost practitioners of economic development in the country. And to do this in Ann Arbor is a special treat. I don't have to tell you that these are extraordinary times. You can see that just by looking at me. We are facing realities unlike any that we've known in our lifetime. And these roughly in sequential order are the things that we have had to deal with since roughly the beginning of the year. A pandemic unlike any that we've known in our lifetime, precipitating an economic crisis that we are still in the midst of, and then seemingly out of nowhere, a series of social unrests that are still very much with us. And then most recently in the news, climate change. It's ironic that that climate change issue is upon us at this time, but it's not unrelated. And really at the core of my entire address to you is how these realities that we can't escape interlink with each other. But the theme that I want to hit upon, what I want to leave you with, and what I want to emphasize over and over is that there is a framework for understanding what we're going through. And that is to understand that these trends, these trends that you see when you open the newspaper every day, are not something that comes from nowhere. And to understand them is not to try to predict the future, but to understand that these are trends that have been in place and that are now being accelerated, first by COVID-19 and then by the economic crisis that we're currently in. And to show this relationship you can see that what we do in the economic development world, the industries that we support, the move toward electrification that would mitigate some of these things, have an effect on climate, which in turn have an effect on everything that we're experiencing now. I was most recently in Bend, Oregon. Fortunately, my home is in good shape so far, but the roads that we have driven on the way to Portland, the towns along those roads, they simply don't exist any longer. So I wanna leave you with first that thought that these are trends that have been going on for generations and that they are accelerating. And the second point I wanna leave you with is that there is a cascading effect 
to all of these trends. Now, I want to take a quick look at one of those, which is the climate change. And our analysts at TIP did a quick analysis of the New Orleans diaspora after 2005. Now, I want to show you this because in the New York Times today, and today being about a week before your presentation, it raised the question of where are the people going that are in Oregon and Washington and California as a result of their displacement? And this was the answer in 2005 from Hurricane Katrina. And you can see that even you in Ann Arbor, and of course us in Texas, where I am now, and across the nation, all felt that diaspora. And as climate change affects us, these demographic shifts are part of the cascading effect of these massive changes that we're experiencing. So let's take a look at what we mean when we say cascading effects. What we mean is that any one of these crises that we are dealing with ripples out throughout the entire economy in ways that we are still trying to understand. We could take any one of these and spend the next two to three hours really understanding how it affects healthcare or housing or demographics or logistics or any of those things. And we've done a lot of that work at TIP and we're seeing what those cascading effects look like. We looked at retail where we're shocked to find that in 2019, total retail sales that were online still accounted for less than 12% of all sales. It's been a rapid increase since 2000, but still a very small percentage. Now we know that that compressed time frame in which change would normally take place is going to be profound. Health and medicine. Many of you, I'm sure, have already done remote visits to your doctors and nurses. Education. Here you are at the University of Michigan, seeing that education is rethinking its very foundation of how information is conveyed. And the supply chain near and dear to the hearts of economic developers. Well, we're only going to look at two of those trends and think about them in the context of Ann Arbor. And those two trends that I'd like to look at with you are number one, remote work, and number two, social equity. Now, it's not going to come as a surprise to you to hear me say that these different factors interlink with each other. And understanding how that affects you and what it means for the decisions that you make in Ann Arbor are really going to determine your future in ways that are still new to us, but that we have to dig into in a much deeper way than we have in the past. So let's begin with the ripple effects of remote work. What are the cascading effects? Well, the first of those, very obviously, is in commercial office construction and leasing. Now, I don't want to be a doomsayer here about the future of commercial office, but even if we had a small decline after years of gain, it would have a profound effect on all of us. And if it were true that we're going to spend less time in offices, what would that mean to transportation? We're already seeing that. We're seeing it in major metros where commute times are a fraction of what they were. Austin has already proposed that all employers reduce their in-office time by two days a week. That's a 40% reduction in transportation. And in public transit, the effect would be equally profound. In urban design, if we don't have to commute to work, why do we need the parking that we've had in the past? Residential is affected because do we really need to live close to our place of work if our place of work is home? And what about green space? We can rethink green space in entirely new ways. And then another ripple effect is demographic shifts. I mentioned that when I looked at the Katrina diaspora. But that's occurring now as we rethink the urban landscape, as we think the relationship to suburbs, and the critical role that I think university towns will be playing. So let me illustrate that very quickly by telling you what's happening with Pinterest. This was their proposed headquarters in San Francisco. They just walked away from this new corporate headquarters construction at a cost to them of $89. $0.5 million to break that lease, $89.5 million. That's really putting your 
money where your mouth is when you anticipate change on the scale that we're seeing it. And the Twitter spokesperson in that same vein recently said, if our employees are in a role that allows them to work from home and they want to, they can continue to do so forever, forever. And they intend to make that happen. This may be the scenario that those traditional offices are facing. And they know that. And on the point of demographic shifts and what it can mean to you and who's looking at what communities that they might relocate to. This is two weeks ago, an anonymous survey of tech workers in the Bay Area. And two thirds of the people that responded to, those, to that survey basically said that they would consider the leaving the region permanently if they were allowed to work from home. This is a profound shift. This gives evidence to what we as a trend, as a trend spotter, have been looking at for the last 20 odd years when you heard millennials say, if I could work anywhere, where would I work from? That reality is now becoming a possibility. And then to put a very fine point on it, Eric Arts, who's the president and CEO of REI, speaking about their abandonment of their new corporate headquarters outside of Seattle. And I think this quote is really critical to our understanding where we are and why we are at the inflection point that will change so much of our economic modeling. The dramatic effects, events of 2020 have challenged us to re-examine and rethink every aspect of our business and many assumptions of the past. So when we look at that and we ask ourselves, what is the social equity component in all of this as another trend that we need to follow? And I think the first thing that we really need to understand that's critical that we sometimes forget when we live in our bubble is that not everyone can work from home. And when you look at the equity component of what it means for those who can work from home and those who don't, and you begin by looking at it through a racial lens, you see that less than one in five black workers and roughly one in six Latinx workers can work from home. If you take a look at that proportion in the Anglo population or in the Asian American population, you see a very different picture. In fact, in the white population, it's roughly proportional. In the Asian American population, it's even higher. And in the meanwhile, high wage workers are six times as likely to be able to work from home as lower wage workers. And again, this ripples through different industries in different ways and has different effects depending upon your family structure. So you have heard economists talk about what letter best represents where this economy is going. And you've heard talk of the V-shaped recovery and the W, which it felt like we were in because we took a dip. We've come back. In fact, looking at the paper today, we see that retail sales are up for the third or fourth straight month. A recent CEO survey that was just completed showed tremendous optimism about their forecasts for their businesses. But if you think of it in terms of a K-shaped recovery and look at the share of small businesses with, paid, with no paid employees who work remotely and you look at it by metro area, you begin to understand that the entire nation is going to feel different because the recovery will be vastly uneven. And what does that unevenness look like? And this is in some ways the most revealing and the most disturbing slide that I can show you because we track the recovery from the recession by jobs from the beginning of the Great Recession in 2007 to when, roughly when it ended in 2009, and then looked at the current recession, just the first two quarters of that. Now, what this chart shows you, and it takes a time, a while to absorb this, it takes me a year to absorb this, but it basically what it says is that a recovery from a recession as our economy is structured now is driven almost entirely by people with a college education or higher. Those with a high school degree or less actually have lost jobs since the recession in total. And if you look at those two most recent quarters, you can see that the recovery is even more pronounced among college-educated workers. And these have ballooning effects. They have ripple effects. 
And if I read every one of these bubbles to you, I think you would be so depressed that we'd want to end this keynote. And we don't, because there is a call to action in all of this. But we have to recognize that these cascading effects are exacerbating economic inequality. And as the Times called it, it's setting up a devastating feedback loop. But what we need to understand here is that inequity is an economic risk to us all. And there are real costs to having a significant part of our population unable to participate in this recovery. We could add $2.7 trillion to the US economic output if we closed racial earning gaps. We could add three and a quarter trillion to state and local taxes if we increase the earnings power of those minorities. And in many cases are not minorities anymore within our economy. And just by reducing barriers for blacks and women's between, uh, women between 1960 and 2008, we added 25% to our GDP. And one of the things that we really need to understand in this is that Sadly, a rising tide does not lift all boats. This is the S&P against the median household income. And this is another way of saying that something you've all been hearing lately, which is that the stock market is not the economy. Corporations can do well while household income stagnates. And we could go on at length about how unequal that household income is by racial demographics but it's true across the board. So where does that leave us? It leaves us asking, what is the true challenge of resiliency? Now, I was reluctant to use the word resiliency because resiliency, well, honestly, we tend to think of it in, in, in terms that are very short-sighted. Short it's Sally, Hurricane Sally, hitting the Mississippi and Alabama coasts and Louisiana coasts as we speak, or at least we speak in my time and that will probably linger for some several days. And we think of the forest fires in the Pacific Northwest and California as having a certain duration that we deal with them. When we put them out, we move on to something else. And, but resiliency is more than sandbags and more than FEMA coming to the rescue. Resiliency is preparation for an understanding of these trends and how they cascade upon us and the options we have for dealing with them. So when we think about resiliency, we need to think of it more like this, as potentially falling dominoes, which if we don't arrest that fall, means that we won't recover equitably. And it's that question of what an equitable recovery looks like that should be foremost in our minds. So when we talk about resiliency, let's talk about it first by asking who's vulnerable? Who's vulnerable within this period of recovery and change that we're all facing now. And the vulnerability is not that worker who can work from home. I like to say that what's happened with COVID-19 is that we've had a massive national beta test to determine whether those who could work from home could do so productively. And we have passed that test. And we're proud of having passed that test. And this presentation is evidence that we can do that. But the people that are going to clean the buildings and the hospitals that we work in, the distinction between tech and touch is one that we sometimes lose sight of. We has to, have to ask ourselves, who is vulnerable here? And we have to ask ourselves what these changing effects mean on the fiscal health of our communities. What are the tax impacts I mentioned online retail sales earlier. Well, online retail sales, we're proving, are working for us. And Amazon is moving very rapidly to make that an even easier reality in terms of how we order, how quickly the products are delivered, how easy they are to return, all of these things. And what it has done, it has changed the transactional model. When COVID-19 first hit, I started getting on the phone and every day I resolved to make two to three phone calls with either current clients or recent clients. And I wanted their reaction to what was facing them. And one of the very first calls I had was with Mike Haddad, 
who is the chairman of the board and recent CEO of one of the largest private dairy companies in the nation with a global footprint and thousands of employees. And Mike Haddad said to me that the first thing that he was going to do was to examine every transactional relationship within the company, within Schreiber Foods, and asked whether or not that physical transaction could be done differently. The next call I had was with the city manager of Las Vegas. And what happened there was the same thing. He was rethinking all transactions within the city of Las Vegas in response to COVID-19, but also as a way of saying, we have the capability of doing that. We could have done it earlier. Now we have a reason to do it. All of these things, however, come with tax impacts. So we really need to get to the point where we ask, how does Ann Arbor respond? What does a response look like if you want to take not only these trends seriously, but the acceleration of those trends and the ripple effect, the cascading effect of those trends? And so that really calls for us to rethink what we mean by resiliency, to put new meaning into that word, and to see it as a call to action. And we want to do it across four different sectors. And the first is economic health. And as I've said, resiliency in the most ordinary use of that in the economic model was simply to diversify the economy. But now we have to think about it in an entirely different way. What would it mean for us to become less dependent on oil and gas? And speaking from Texas, where that has been so much of our economy, it's a bit of a shock to imagine that. But we can imagine it because we have to imagine it. The shocks that have hit us and the four that I showed at the beginning, which are roughly in sequential order, are not the end of the story. So we need to think about economic health as it relates to all of the other crises that we could be facing. We need to think of it also in terms of the social fabric. Now, just last week, I was on the call with a former client of ours in Kenosha. And the story in Kenosha is one that you now know very well. It's really at the heart of so much of the ripple effects of the protests that we have seen. And what Todd Battle said to me when I talked to him, and he's the Economic Develop Development Director of the Kenosha Area Business Alliance, what Todd said to me is that we knew that this was true. We knew that there, was, there were two communities within Kenosha. We did not move fast enough or aggressively enough to make us one community. And when I asked him what I thought would be a setup question, and I wanted to give him room to express some of the conservative sentiments, home of Uline and home of many other conservative companies. I, gave, I wanted to give him the leeway. I, and I said to him, Todd, is this something that's just going to blow over? Can we just walk away from this? And he took a long pause and he said, we cannot. We shouldn't have in the first place and we can't have in the future. Because the tinderbox that is social inequity is affecting every aspect of the community's future. We also need to rethink resiliency in terms of climate change, as I mentioned earlier. It's no longer feasible for us to say that we can come over here and do industry recruitment one way and ignore its effects on the other. We have to take this seriously in ways that we haven't before. We have to say, what are we investing in? And you at the University of Michigan, I think, have begun that process. The relationship to Detroit is a way to rethink climate change. And there's another call that I made was with one of the key mobility people at Ford. And I asked Kathleen, what's happening with Ford? And she said the same thing that the CEO of REI said. We are rethinking the entire model of what it means to produce automobiles. We're thinking about the engines that drive those, the supply chain that goes into those cars. We're thinking about what ownership of cars would look like. We're thinking about the relationship of cars to the self-driving model. Every aspect of our business is in flux. And climate change is a key component of that. 
And then the fourth and last one that I want to emphasize in terms of rethinking resiliency is in community investment. And the community investment question in the, again, the more traditional model is simply to say, how ready are we for flooding in the upper Midwest or hurricanes on the Gulf Coast or forest fires on the West Coast? What are we doing around that? But it has to be bigger. We have to think differently because the income streams as a result of these cascading effects, those income streams are affecting us differently. In other words, we're not going to have the same sources of revenue. To return to the commercial real estate and the office market, what happens if even without a catastrophic decline in terms of office leasing and office construction, if it drops only 10 or 15 percent, what does that do to your tax base? The same question can be asked about real estate. And if that's true, commercial real estate, and if that's true, what does community investment look like? Where do we put our money? How do we think about our investments? And that's where these conversations that we've been having with our clients and in our communities really open up the door to entirely new ways of thinking about what is possible for us now. Now, I hope that this talk has not discouraged you. And I want to end on a positive note. And that positive note is, is an historical note. And this is a story that I'm going to end on, on Jon Snow. Now, it's not the Jon Snow that you're thinking about. This is not Game of Thrones. This is Jon Snow in London in 1845, who was trying to understand what caused cholera deaths. And this doctor, who's famous in epidemiological circles, surmised that a single well that people were drinking from was the cause of that cholera epidemic. And here's the interesting thing. Nobody believed him. In fact, you had politicians and you had community leaders that spent years trying to disprove his thesis. But he was right. And out of the realization that that contaminated water was the cause of that epidemic, we began to make significant changes in our infrastructure, our community investment, our investment model changed. We decided, that is to say, the Londoners decided, that they had to act on this, that the cost of not acting, of taking water right out of the Thames or pumping it into unfiltered water that everyone drank from and died from, couldn't continue any longer. So the system that, we, that was set up after 1845, looking at this relationship of pumps to deaths from cholera, caused a massive transformation in our whole infrastructure model. I want to say that you in Ann Arbor and we across the nation need to take that same approach. We need to think about these crises. We need to think about the accelerating trends and the ripple effects of those trends. In terms of our community investment, we need to think about them in terms of climate change, and we need to think of in terms of social equity and our economic health. All of these become critical to where we need to end up. So I'm going to end here, and knowing that there will be many questions, I will be live to answer those questions, and I want to say again what an honor it is to have been here and to begin this dialogue with you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to be part of this. And um, while I'm waiting for questions to come in, I have a few that were submitted in advance. And I'd like to answer at least a couple of those uh, while we're waiting. The first question that I received was really about what was going to happen on the state level and um, from a budget standpoint. So I took a little bit of a look at where um, Michigan was. And one of the things that was interesting to me is, is reliance on sales tax. And in that sense, you are 
much less vulnerable in certain other states, among them Nevada and Hawaii and others. But I think the important thing here at the state level is for the budget analysts and the uh, econometricians to sit down and say, what does our budget currently rely on? What is it that we are um, most dependent on and how do the trends that we've been discussing affect those revenue streams? I think that, that would be the right approach uh, for Michigan to take and, and really for every state to take is a complete, completely fresh look at where income streams come from. Um, the second question that I received had to do with uh, commercial property trends in, in Ann Arbor. And I, I looked at those, I, in fact, I looked at your last presentation at Spark. And at that time, and this is January, February, uh, you look very good. Uh, you look very solid in terms of low vacancy rates and so forth. I, I haven't seen, and I don't know if they're available, any of uh, current data, but I would guess that those property trends are in the same um, level of turmoil that they are in many other communities, but not all communities. So I think it's a, really a question now of bringing the commercial real estate folks together in a, in a very concerted way. In Austin, we have uh, RECA, the Real Estate Council of Austin, that is very involved with the chamber and with the economic development organization. So I think that level of involvement at a, at, at a higher level, which is to say, let's take a look at what office construction uh, looks like. And as Paul has been pointing out, uh, what does it mean for the startup community as well? And what would office redesign potentially um, mean? Um, the other question that I'm seeing now are suggestions for changing the way we approach or think about touch versus uh, tech when it comes to uh, economic development strategies and not just economic development strategies. And we have available for you, and I'm going to make this available to Paul, what we call an occupational risk analysis tool. And that tool looks at, uh, we'll be looking at Ann Arbor by uh, zip code. And so we can literally tell you the number of jobs that are at risk uh, from COVID exposure. That is to say the touch jobs versus those that can work from home. And also those jobs that are vulnerable within uh, the framework of, um, of jobs disappearing as a result of technology growth. And once you have that picture, which I say we're happy to share with Paul uh, and, and with Spark, uh, you will have a better idea of what it is that we need to do when we are addressing um, the um, jobs that cannot uh, be performed um, from home. And out of that understanding, first of all, of what you look like uh, at the city and regionally, uh, we can begin to, to talk about some of those strategies. Um, an another question that came out in advance that I liked uh, very much was, um, was the question of the mobility corridor. And I, I think what that means for uh, the relationship to Detroit, I think, I think this, what looks like being at the forefront is really uh, something we should think of as nothing less than just keeping uh, on touch of current trends within the automotive industry. I don't think there's anyone that isn't seeing the, the potential for self-driving cars and you have that corridor between uh, Detroit and Ann Arbor that's opening up. I think that, that is a way of saying we can, through smart cities, through highway rethinking, through our relations with corporate uh, players, um, really taking advantage of that. And, and, and to another question about the electrification of the transportation sector in general, I, I, I see that as inevitable. And I think the more rapidly we move there, uh, the greater the economic advantages for us will be. Um, Another question, uh, I have several here that are coming in now, so excuse me while I take a look at them. Um, this is a, a question about um, the um, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor um, uh, and creation of new jobs. Um, what I'm reading here is creating 10 new jobs for every new bedroom. So 84,000 commuters per day, pricing people out. This is something that's been very um, 
very, very much on my mind recently. And I've, uh, I've been on the phone with people in uh, Boulder, uh, Colorado as my immediate benchmark. And I, I think that the housing question um, is something that um, economic developers, again, this was an existing trend. This, was, this is not new, but it rapidly accelerated by uh, COVID-19. I'm, I'm tremendously excited at the prospects for Ann Arbor. I think uh, Paul is in some ways an, an enviable position in terms of the opportunities that, um, that um, are before him and before you. But, but it, it is, and, and, and Boulder is that model, one based on increasing inequity. And having worked in, in Sun Valley in Idaho, we saw this pattern exist already 10, 15 years ago. Um, everything looks good. Property taxes uh, are strong, but everyone that is in a touch profession is having to commute further and further. And so the question of what they can do to help is to take this question of housing seriously. And while density may be a, uh, a problematic solution right now in terms of COVID-19, this is where we, I think, really need to sit down with some of the leading firms uh, and talk about uh, redesign within density and making density, um, rethinking the terminology around density and what we can do to prevent uh, COVID-19 risks while at the same time doing some very exciting things in, um, in bringing lower cost housing to these um, communities that are seeing such rapid uh, $500 a square foot residential. And, and we're working with Cushing Terrell and with Perkins Will, some of the leading design firms in the nation to do exactly that. Um, so I think this, this question of the University of Michigan um, and its role here is, is to really think about a broader community strategy. And by broader community strategy, what I'm talking about is, is one that, let's just call it that talks about the capital plans of the university, uh, of the comp plan, the comprehensive plan of the city, the economic development strategy of SPARC, and says, and says let's look at this in, in the most holistic way possible. And about 20 odd years ago, Austin did that in, in, in Vision uh, Austin. And uh, we were part of that process. Uh, that, that was done by Friggin AC Calthorpe Associates. And it really looked at the regional picture and talked about some of the realities about pricing that's outside of uh, the city proper and, um, and what it would mean to link those residential units, in our case, Dell in uh, Williamson County in Ann Arbor, excuse me, in uh, uh, Round Rock uh, uh, to the downtown and what new transportation options would be required. I think, I think the potential now to see COVID-19 and those jobs that can work from home as a way of redesigning, if you will, the regional landscape, but also creating opportunities for those touch jobs within this redesign. So really what I'm arguing for is a broader comprehensive uh, strategy that is an Envision Ann Arbor that takes these different components of growth at the university, at the city, and at Spark, and at the region and says, we can do this differently. We can make different kinds of investments than we have made in the past. Um, as I'm looking at some of the other questions that are coming in, I have one more that, um, that it was intriguing to me, and that was the question of what new business sectors have the best opportunity, opportunities for growth in Southeast Michigan. Now, Paul and I have not spoken about this specifically, but entrepreneurial opportunity is going to have to be rethought. In other words, the way in which new businesses start, the way they access the market, and the way in which they are brought into the um, uh, economic uh, structure of um, Ann Arbor and of the state is not going to look the way it has in the past. I, I think the potential here is precisely in bridging this gap between tech and touch. I think those companies that can, um, that can move rapidly to address that question 
will offer some of the very best um, growth mechanisms for communities. And I, I, I don't know of anyone better to do that than Ann Arbor. What I'm saying in effect, and, um, and I'd really like to stress this point, is that entrepreneurship around social equity solutions may also be some of the best business propositions available to us. So uh, as we wind down, I, I, I'm uh, open for any additional questions now or in the future, if you want to type those in. If not, um, please feel free to reach out to uh, Paul with your questions and any that uh, we uh, can help with, as with um, the uh, tool that I described, the occupational risk tool that we're happy to share with you, or uh, follow up on any of the points that we've made and how specifically it affects uh, Ann Arbor would be delighted to do so. So I want to thank uh, Spark again. I want to say thank Paul and, and Jen for working to make all of this possible. And I, I'm just delighted to have been part of it. Um, thank you all very much. Well, John, thank you so much for uh, joining us in this different way uh, that we hoped would have been live in April. But I also think that uh, given what's happened since April, uh, your remarks and your insights um, about these accelerating trends are really something that we need to think through as Spark thinks about its strategic plan and in our engagement with the rest of the partners that we have in the community as they prepare their plans. So uh, again, all of you, thank you for joining us. Uh, as you could tell, much of the presentation was pre-recorded, but we did have this live segment and uh, I'm enjoying being able to talk to you in that way for a few minutes. Uh, first, I really want to once again thank our annual meeting sponsors, our premier sponsors, Comcast Business, DT Energy, and our partner sponsor, First Martin. As much as we're proud of the results that we shared with you today about the past year, an important part of our work is to look forward. And as we look to the future, we can't deny the importance of sustainability in the context of what John just talked about in terms of resiliency and the issues around climate change. To that end, we're proud to announce today that we've partnered with DT Energy to go 100% renewable energy through its MI Green Power program. Amber Spark's investment in MI Green Power will offset 334,000 pounds of CO2 annually, which is equivalent to preserving 200 acres of US forests in a year. This commitment is just one way this year we will advance the health of our economy. We encourage all companies and individuals in DTE service area to join this initiative if they can. Now, as David mentioned, we're in the midst of our biggest week of the year, A2Tech 360. And if you register for Tech Trek, you might get a great t-shirt like the one I'm wearing today. Um, I invite you to check out what we've planned for the remainder of the week. A2 Tech 360 dedicates itself to promoting the ecosystem of the Ann Arbor area of innovation. Today is day three of seven days of tech-related events, creating connections that are meaningfully generating discussion, ideas, and new opportunities. A2 Tech aligns with Spark's mission to advance the economy of the region as a desired place for innovation, business location, and growth, and for talented people to live and work. You can learn more at a2tech360.com. Here's a teaser. Finally, as we close today, I invite you to join us in our efforts in the following ways. Please support Spark's work program financially and encourage others to do so if you can. Attend Spark events and invite your contacts to do likewise. Share your support of Spark with your local elected officials. And if you are an elected official, do the same with your constituents. Follow Spark on social media and share with your networks. 
And lastly, promote Spark's role in accelerating startups and attracting community and company investment with your organizations and the rest of the community. We really want to thank you for sharing a part of your day with us. Looking forward, really, really very much so, to being with you in person next year for all the great networking and connections we make when we're all together. So please be well and be safe.